So who's our guest today? Well, he's a professor here at East Tennessee State University of Theater and Dance, and he's an actor. He's been featured on off-Broadway shows, and he was a regular on sitcoms such as Home Improvement, Full House, and Seinfeld. Please welcome to the show, Pat Cronin. Pat. Ray, my thank former you, thank student. Thank you so much for coming. <laughs> thank you. So before we sit down, we have a game. And because this is the icebreaker, our game is called the icebreaker. Icebreaker. Very creative and very, very original. Good. All right. All right, Pat, thank you so much for coming. So the game you got was name that character. Now, how it works is you've been on a lot of things. Your IMDb is one of the longest I've seen. And we're going to play a clip from some things you've been in, and you can tell me what that character was. Okay. Maybe name it, describe the person. All right. Are you ready? I'm ready. All right, let's play the icebreaker. Name that character. First character. Good to be around Brazilians. <laughs> That's an incredible story. You have a remarkable passion for Brazilians. There's more than just on the way to me, Mr. Fox. So, <laughs> well, I guess we heard, we heard who it was. But tell I, me a little about that character I, I mean, and where it's it, from. It was Sid Farkas. Uh, he was the bra manufacturer on Seinfeld. And uh, it was my favorite role. I did over 200 television shows and films in a 30-year career. And it was my favorite. For, for several reasons. Uh, Larry David is a genius. Yes. Word, that word gets thrown around too much. But Larry was a genius. James Burroughs was a genius, the director on Cheers. Uh, so when I auditioned for that show, uh, we were in a tiny little space, and there's all the other actors who were waiting outside, and I was waiting and listening to the other actors, some of whom were, you know, famous. And they go in, and, and they're getting huge laughs. I mean, big laughs. And I'm sitting in there looking at the script going, big laughs, okay. So I saw the guy as serious. I mean, I saw him as believing in men's brassiers. It yeah. was really a great idea. So I go in, and Jerry Seinfeld is there, and Larry David in a room of writers, and it begins. And I go, uh, so uh, what do you see in the back? Hooks, Velcro, Velcro. Oh, yeah. You know, selling brassiers to uh, women we're only utilizing 50% of the market. Well, no laughs, zip, nada, I'm getting nothing. So I'm thinking, they're gonna ask me to burn my SAG card, this is not good. <laughs> so I finish, dead room, and Larry David says, that was funny. And Jerry Seinfeld shortly says, yes, that was funny. So those lines, were they included in the actual filming of the show? Yeah. They were. So now, we have another clip for you. Okay. Name this character. I guess he just found out what his dinner cost. Do you know who that character is? It's actually my favorite movie, so if you don't know, it's, I'm going to be very hurt. Well, I didn't do many movies, so Splash. It was Splash. Okay, good. <laughs> I'm not going to let you keep guessing, but Splash is actually one of my favorite movies. Did you have any scenes with Tom Hanks that, that I don't know of? Because No, I had. That was funny. I mean, all, all showbiz stories are kind of funny. Uh, Ron Howard had been a friend of my wife's, Beatrice Colden, Lord Rester, who was on Happy Days as Marsha the Car Hop. And Wonder Woman, right? And Wonder Woman, she was at a candy. Anyway, um, when Ronnie, uh, Ron was auditioning for Splash, uh, the uh, producer was a guy named John Lennox, Lord Rester, who also died at age 50 of a heart attack. And John got me in to read for Ron. And I uh, read for the Secret Service agent who captures the mermaid. I don't remember that he had a name. If he does, I don't remember it. Uh, anyway, uh, I had a big scene with um, 
Oh, the, 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 the villain guy. Uh, I'm blanking on his name. We actually became pretty good friends during that show. It's Eugene Levy. Oh, yeah, Eugene Levy. Anyway, I had a big scene with Eugene Levy and uh, then the scene capturing the mermaid. Anyway, the scene with Gene Levy was very funny and took place in the kitchen of the hotel. And um, two days after the film was made uh, and, and shot in San, they showed it in San Diego. So Ron Howard called me and he said, I've got good news and bad news. And I said, okay. He said, the good news is your scene with Gene Levy rated the funniest scene in the movie. The bad news is we're cutting it. Oh no, so there's something I haven't seen? And unfortunately, when they've done the remakes and everything, I thought it would, you know, special yeah. effects. Uh, it's never seen the light of anything. So wow, I need to see those scenes. I so would love to see I'll that figure scene. it out. All right. So tell me about, a little about where you grew up and how you, how you got into acting. Well, I got into showbiz, really. Um, I was two and a half years old and I was living in West Philadelphia. My parents were from Ireland, my father was from Cork, and my mother was from Mayo, and uh, I was an only child. My, my parents practiced Irish birth control. They dated for 11 years. <laughs> it's true. And then I was born, I'm sure, an accident. And they thought so. In any event, I was singing in the house, and my father was an alcoholic and was absent a lot. And uh, he came in one night. I hadn't seen, I didn't know who the hell this guy was that came into the house. And I was singing Red River Valley by Gene Autry. And I had a, we had a wind-up Victrola, and I was singing. And he looked at me, and he said, Joe, that's a other long story. My name isn't Joe. <laughs> <laughs> okay, he, I, I can get where well, he was coming from. Well, I mean, my name is Patrick Joseph Cronin. And, okay. And my aunt, his sister, said, oh, Patty, he's too cute to be Pat. We'll call him Joey. And he said... My God, St. Patrick was the saint of Ireland and my father's name and my... He was drunk for six months. When he died in Temple Hospital of lung cancer, he was the last person alive who still called me Joe or Joe. Okay. In spite of his hating it. Anyway, he says, if you're going to be singing in a house all the time, you should at least sing something good. So he picked me up and I was like typical Irish kid. I was 60 pounds. I couldn't walk till I was five because they were so used to being poor and starved, they fed you potatoes nonstop. So they carried me upstairs, put me on the toilet, which I thought was symbolic. And then he taught me five songs, Danny Boy, The Rose of Trolley, The Boys of the County Court, The Irish Soldier Song, and Back to Donegal. Mm -hmm. And I learned them. And so in those days, there was a church and a bar on every corner. So he carried me into the bar I was two and a half, almost three. He put me on the bar, and he ordered, he drank shots and beers. Uh, Corby's and drafts, 40 cents. So he ordered a shot and a beer, and he looked at me, and he said, all right, bye, start singing. Oh, the pale moon was rising above the green mountain. Yeah, we can only do 10 seconds, because we that's, don't have the budget. That's right. So, <laughs> yes, that's right, we get approval. Anyway, the old Irishman who was shellacked at the bar said, give that man a drink. Well, he's too young. Give his old man a drink. So my father got uh, five shots, five beers, and we went to the next bar, and that's how I got into showbiz. So when did you start uh, teaching at ETSU? How, how many years ago was that? I, I came in 99. My wife was dying, and uh, I had a friend who was teaching here, Charles Roberts, uh, who was chair of the Department of Mass Communication. And he said, why don't you teach? Because he knew my wife would be dead shortly, and I was sort of taking care of her nonstop. And uh, I said, gee, I don't know. I didn't like teaching the last time. He said, yeah, but you were drunk. I said, well, that's true. So he said, uh, why don't you come and... And they had a thing called the Basler Chair. It was a very prestigious thing, and I applied for it. Uh, beat out a couple of really good people and got it. And so I came in as the Basler Chair of Academic Excellence. I was here for a semester. I commuted uh, back for my wife every weekend. She was funny. She was a New York Jewish person from Upper East Side. And I was here for about two months or a month and a half when all of a sudden I was starting to get a little bit of an accent going because <laughs> I lived here. And so I called her one night and I said, uh, well, I'll be home, uh, Betsy, uh, this weekend. Good Lord willing and the creek don't rise. 
She said, don't come back. <laughs> You're too country. <laughs> don't come back. I need a New York boy. I need a New York guy. <laughs> so, I, anyway, Lord, she died in, uh, I was here for four months, I went back. She died in, no, in November of 99, and in December, they asked me to be the commencement speaker at the graduation, and I did that and loved it. And all of a sudden, I discovered that, you know, in, in L.A., I didn't know any Republicans. Everybody was a Democrat. And I, you know, but all of a sudden, here I am, a Democrat, member of the ACLU, you know. I'm not the usual fit. Yeah. <laughs> but all of a sudden, I met students here who were like me. I was the first in my family to finish high school. I was the first in my family, obviously, to go to college, grad school. And I was meeting a lot of students here who were like me. They were first in their family. It's a terrible struggle to be the first in your family to do this stuff. And I found it was a, I was a bit of an assist to people like that, and I loved that. And then, uh, anyway, uh, I went back to L.A. for a while, but it was too painful to yeah. be back there without Betsy. And so uh, I came back. I adjuncted for a year. And then they offered me a contract in the English department, and I said yes. And so I've been here 17 years. Wow. 19 so I, years counting the basement. I actually took one of your classes. You did, and you got the wrong class. Yeah, I, th I told you the wrong class, and you were very confused. Well, yeah, I thought, well, <laughs> Alzheimer's is setting in, you know. I, I didn't remember the big ray in my, I thought, wait a minute, I, but it wasn't that class. But yeah, it was that. acting one, and I took acting for the camera also. Yes. Well, how do you connect with students on a more personal level? Because I know in your class, you did share a lot of personal stories in order to make us better actors. Do you think, um, do you have any curriculum that you set up for yourself? to say, this is the style of teaching I will do, or do you just go in there and wing it every week? I don't wing it. <laughs> I mean, it might look like it, but um, I firmly believe the teachers who made me better were teachers who shared their life experience. I mean, I, I know a lot of students go through classes, they have no idea whether the teacher is gay, straight, divorced, alcoholic, mm -hmm. what the hell he's doing or she's doing. Whereas with me and with Chris Dula, who was also a wonderful teacher, they, they know a lot about us. You know, Chris talks about drug addiction and being arrested. I talk about being alcoholic, being arrested. Okay. Talk about white male privilege and why being arrested didn't hurt me because I was white. I mean, you know, I mean, I like to bring, I was talking about an acting one today. I had three African Americans in my acting one class and I was saying, I benefited from white male privilege because I never had to compete against good black actors yeah. until 1998 or 99, right before I quit. I lost a couple of jobs to good black actors. So that means before yeah. I had 20 years of not having to compete against good black actors. So there are social movements such as like Black Lives Matter and things like that. Is there any movement that you um, personally support or stand behind? I think Black Lives Matter is important. Yeah. I think uh, I, I wouldn't know what to do with it if I had a, a black son to talk to him about going out on the street. Mm -hmm. I mean, and to say it's a terrorist organization is absurd. I mean, that's nonsense. That's just nonsense. And uh, when the woman was here, who was one of the co-founders, I gave extra credit for going to her lecture, and I went. It was excellent. And I talked to the students about, as I say, being a member of the ACLU, which is not their background. I'm a firm believer in First Amendment, and um, you know, I think it's a big safeguard we have uh, in a country that could otherwise go strange. So you talk a little about your alcoholism, yeah. but it it is sort of a stereotype that actors going into Hollywood, there's a lot of pressure and stress, and you may turn to alcohol and drugs as a way to cope. Is is that something you you sort of well, I, I, first of all, I think it's, some of it's genetic. Okay. Uh, my father was an alcoholic. My mother became an alcoholic. My aunt was an alcoholic. I'm an alcoholic. So clearly it's a genetic base. Um, I don't think, you know, when you go to an AA meeting, um, somebody will say, oh, I had to drink because I was a long-distance truck driver. What else could I do? Uh, not drink, for example. <laughs> so everybody thinks their business causes the yeah. drinking or their marriage or that's all nonsense. I drank because I'm a drunk. And I didn't drink for fun. I drank to get drunk. Yeah. I, I didn't drink to have a good time. I drank to get drunk. 
And I knew that from day one. I mean, I, I knew right away that I was an alk. At 19, I was drinking four-fifths of whiskey a day. Wow. I'd come into class with a bottle and a styrofoam cup, and, you know, just sit in class getting smashed. So how did you manage to achieve so much? But I was also... lucky. I was an alcoholic overachiever. You, you know, I, I didn't want the alcohol to prevent me from doing things. So in spite of the drinking, I got a bachelor's degree and a master's degree, but I was drunk through all of it, but um, I was blessed or whatever it was, lucky, some of it, um, but eventually at age 32, I was ready to die, I, my liver was the size of a football field, and I had what they call in AA, that spiritual moment, because the disease is threefold, it's physical, mental, and spiritual, uh, and I had lost everything, I'd lost my mind, I'd lost my spirit, I'd lost everything. And I stood up, at a bottle in my hand. I was 280 pounds. I'm now 192, so I'm not skinny. But I was obese, and I was the booze just rolling out of my mouth. And I said, God, take this. You can't do this anymore. Yeah. And that was it. I mean, now I went to three meetings a day for a year. So you, didn't, you don't get sober just by being lucky. Do you still find it difficult to cope with? today, since it's been 44 it's years, 44 right? years since I've had a drink. Um, I would say, uh, no, I mean, I have moments uh, where, um, you know, uh, it's still, you know, I still like to drink. I mean, <laughs> you know, and, but it's not a struggle anymore. No, it has okay. been for a long time. So, uh, so yeah. I know you really love your students. I do. I love my students. Is there... I heard that you have helped some students in the LGBTQ community. Can you tell me a little about that? Well, I've had two in the last couple of years that their parents have disowned them for being gay. And I have the triangle on my door which says I'm a safe place. And they've come to me. And I have two gay students now in the freshman class that while they're out to their parents are still dealing with bullies and dealing with the kind of homophobia that you know, is rampant in areas that use religion, I believe, as a mistool, really. But I don't think we were as strong in our discussion of how religion in this area is not helpful. Yeah, sometimes it can be used to justify actions that are not, not in line helpful. with the teachings of that and religion. And we didn't go on the offensive. But see, any attack on religion, like Moliere's Tartuffe, looks like an, you know, it's not, it's an attack yeah. on hypocrisy. I mean, I mean, when the woman was trapped in adultery and she wasn't found, you know, she was trapped and Christ wrote up ostensibly sins on the ground is what we, the, the legend tells us. And everybody walked away because he wrote everybody's sins yeah. down and he said he was without sin cast That's the, the first, first stone. stone. I don't know where, where that gets lost. I mean, why do religious groups feel comfortable? I had a student two years ago in Mountain City said, a pastor said, let's get all the gays in the center of town and shoot them. Wow. And he said, how do I go to a church like that? I said, you don't. You'll find a church that doesn't do that. But we didn't go after that as strongly as I think we should have because it's not easy around here. Yeah. You know, because everybody sees religion as ipso facto good. And I think it's many times good and many times not so good. Yeah. And Christ saw that too when he drove the, you know, people out of the temple. We were selling religion for money, you know. I mean, oh well. Again, it's not a road I really like going down, but I think it's something worth thinking about. Definitely. So... I want your expert opinion since you're an actor. Is there anything worth watching on television right now? Oh my God, yes. Every, I mean, it's wonderful. I mean, I just started watching Gilmore Girls. Because of me? Because I told you about Amy Sherman Palladino? Partial, partially. Okay, okay. I would take... Just give me some credit. I'm going to give you credit. Right. <laughs> it was really watching The Marvelous Mrs. Yeah. Basil, which I adore. And I looked at the writers and the producers and I said, who are these people? And I saw they created the Gilmore Girls. Yeah. I thought, why didn't I watch that show? So I started last night watching the first three episodes. It's great. It's, it's so wonderful. quick. So quick. And the women in it are wonderful. And they, they cast a lot of people I know. Sally Struthers was a great yeah. of mine from All in the Family. Uh, Dakin Matthews, who's going to be on Broadway with Denzel and Iceman. Yeah. I, I'm taking a group of students to see Denzel Washington and Iceman Cometh. 
Oh, wow. So, you know, um, yeah, it's very exciting times. Anyway, I'm, that's what I'm watching. I, I liked uh, Sneaky Pete was an Amazon Prime show. Loved that. Uh, Goliath with uh, Billy Bob Thornton was great. Uh, it seems like a lot of Amazon shows. Are you going to give any love to Netflix? Anything on Netflix? Oh, yeah, uh, sure. Uh, lots of, uh, I'm trying to think, uh, 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 Fleabag. What about Black Mirror? Have oh, you seen phenomenal. that? Phenomenal. I've seen all but like three. Episodes. Such an interesting show. Wonderful. And such a timely show because you can relate it to a lot that's going on now. You're wondering, is this going to happen? Sure. Yeah. No, it's, it's heaven. All right. Well, thank you so much, Pat, for coming on, sharing your views. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank it was you. great fun. So thank you for joining us here on The Icebreaker, and we'll see you next time. Go out there and make a new friend. Are you ready? All right, let's play The Icebreaker. Name that character. Let there be a room this is. That's an incredible story. You have a remarkable passion for Brazil. You know more than just know whether they use the bus. So, <laughs> well, I guess we heard.